Group headquarters moved on July 4th, with its task force close to the front line to direct the operations of both armies. Our headquarters train, placed on a spare track in the woods, served as our CP. It consisted of two living wagons and two working wagons for me and my chief of staff, a working and sleeping wagon, and a dining car for the operations department, and for the bulk of the intelligence department, as well as for other personnel whose presence was required. The same train included a telephone and radio car, a car for the guard team, and for the anti-aircraft crew of 20 mm guns. The use of such a staff train was quite justified. All assistance and technical means necessary for leadership were at hand, and all this created convenient conditions for work, for accommodation of people and made it possible to change places quickly. Being located behind the front line where an important operation was being conducted, it was easy to get by car or airplane to all commanders and all units. More than once I travelled by train long distances along the front, visiting the headquarters and units of one section during the day, and at night going again to the next section. July 5th began the offensive on the fronts of both armies, after the night before the 4th Tank Army by private attack took possession of the observation points necessary to direct the offensive. In this connection it is possible and necessary to describe in a few words the course of Operation Citadel. It is instructive for all those interested in military matters to trace the constantly changing situation and the resulting tasks of directing the fighting and making the necessary decisions for this purpose, at least on the front of Army Group South. For the battle here only in the first days was a breakthrough, proceeding according to a predetermined plan. As soon as our advancing units were given freedom of manoeuvre on the other side of the enemy's defence line, for the command of the group and for the headquarters of the armies there was always a new situation that required new solutions, albeit within the strictly formulated main idea of the operation. In the section of the Group Center 9 Army, managed in the first two days of the offensive deeply cut into the enemy defences in the offensive zone of the Central and Left Flank Corps. The Right Flank Corps, Porps, on the contrary, advanced insignificantly, the neighbouring corps in fact remained in place. Already on the second day of the offensive, the enemy intensified counter-attacks against the front and flanks of the strike wedge of the army. The enemy began to introduce into the battle operational reserves, which stood at him in the northwestern part of the Kursk Bulge and in front of the southeastern section of the Oral Bulge. This was a sign that the enemy intended to hold the Kursk Bulge under all circumstances, and at the same time that in case of success of Operation Citadel could encircle really large enemy forces. Despite these counter-attacks, the shock wedge of the 9th Army moved forward, although in a strip only 10 kilometres wide. However, on July 9th, the offensive stopped at the enemy defence line on the hilly terrain near Olkovatka, 18 km from the initial positions of the 9th Army. The Army Command assumed that after repelling enemy counter-attacks, moving the main direction of its strike and the introduction of reserves into the battle, it would resume the offensive on July 12th to complete the breakthrough. But this did not happen. July 11th, the enemy large forces went on the offensive from the east and northeast against the 2nd Tank Army, holding the Oral Arc. The development of events in this area forced the command of the Centre Group to suspend the offensive of the 9th Army in order to throw its large mobile forces into the battle at the site of the 2nd Tank Army. And at the front of the Group South, the first breakthrough of the enemy defences also proved to be a difficult matter especially gave itself to know the lack of infantry divisions to strike the first blow, as well as the relative weakness of artillery support offensive. Kempf's army group was unable to advance on the section of his right flank corps to the planned new boundary on the Korocha River, and came only to the area of heights west of the boundary of the River Corin. If the intended goal on this extreme right flank of the offensive operation was not achieved, then still one could be satisfied with the subsequent success of the corps. He drew on himself thanks to his very energetic offensive troops from the enemy's operational reserves, located east of Volchansk. In the following days it achieved great success in defence, inflicting significant losses on the enemy, including losses in tanks. Finally, the group could also be satisfied with the defence on the Corin River, since as a result of this did not reduce the width of its own offensive front. 3TK also had to fight hard. The first attack across the Donets on both sides of Belgorod succeeded him, 
but it was carried out in very difficult conditions. Then the corps apparently stopped in front of the second enemy defensive strip, about 18 km ahead of Donitz. In view of the losses suffered by the troops, the commander of the army group asked whether the offensive should not be suspended here as well. On the basis of a conversation with the commander of 3TK General Breit and his division commanders, I still decided to continue the offensive. Army Group Command gave the corps another 198 PD, standing as a reserve in the rear of the 1st Tank Army on the Donetsk front, despite the fact that even there created a dangerous situation. On July 11th, the corps finally managed to break through the last enemy line of defence. The way was free, and we could take the fight on unprotected terrain with suitable mobile units of the enemy reserves, located east of Kharkov. The group command ordered the right flank of 3TK to move further in the direction of Karocha and the left flank to interact with 4 Tank Army and defeat the enemy's 69th Army, wedged between our two advancing armies. 4 Tank Army in the heavy fighting of the first two days broke through the first and second line of enemy defences. Acting on the left flank of the army in the open terrain tank corps on July 7th, managed to break through to an area about 11 km in front of a Boyan. In the following days it had to repel strong counterattacks of the enemy, conducted from the northeast, north and west, and defeated in these battles significant forces of the advancing enemy troops. In this area and in the area in front of the two SSTK SS, on the part of the enemy operated compounds from the operational reserve, namely three tank corps and one mechanized corps, thrown into battle as part of the 69th and 1st Tank Army, other mechanised corps were thrown in by the enemy from the area east of Kharkov. The right tank corps of the army also managed to reach the operational space. On July 11th it attacked Prokhorovka and then further west forced the Pisil. On July 12th the enemy threw into the battle in the centre and on the flanks of the front of the group's offensive new units from his operational reserves. On July 12th and 13th both armies repulsed all these attacks. On July 14th, the SS Corp, developing success, reached Prokhorovka and the 48th TK came to the Pisila Valley west of Oboyan. In these battles were partly defeated, partly badly damaged other significant forces from the operational reserves of the enemy. In total, the enemy threw into battle against the Group 10 new tank and mechanised corps. These were mostly close reserves prepared by the enemy in front of our front, with the exception of groups in front of the fronts on the Donets and Mayas, where the enemy only only as if preparing an offensive. By July 13th, the enemy had already lost 24,000 prisoners, 1,800 tanks, 267 guns, and 1,080 anti-tank guns on the Citadel front. The battle had reached its highest point. Soon it was to be decided victory or defeat. On July 12th, the group command, however, became aware that the 9th Army was forced to suspend the offensive and that the enemy went on the offensive against the 2nd Tank Army. But the command of our group firmly decided not to prematurely suspend the battle, perhaps before the final victory. We still had 24 TK with 17 TD and the SS Division Viking, which we could throw into the battle as our trump card. Because of this call, please, the group command fought Hitler from the very beginning of the offensive or, rather, from the beginning of its preparation. I will remind you that we have always held the view that if at all to carry out the Operation Citadel, it is necessary to do everything to achieve the success of this enterprise, even at great risk in the Donbass area. For these reasons, the Group Command left, as I have already mentioned, on the Miosk and Donetsk fronts, as reserves only two divisions, providing for the use of 24 TK first as a reserve of the Group in the Operation Citadel, but this required us to report several times to the Okai, until Hitler, afraid of any risk in the Donbass, agreed to place the corps behind the front line of the citadel. The corps, however, was constantly on alert west of Kharkov, albeit as a reserve of the Okai, for which purpose it had been withdrawn from direct command of the group. This was the situation when Field Marshal von Kluge and I were summoned to the Führer's headquarters on July 13th. It would have been more correct, of course, if Hitler himself arrived at both groups, or if he believed that the overall situation did not allow him to leave the Stavka, would have sent the chief of the general staff to us. But during the entire Eastern campaign rarely succeeded in inducing Hitler to go to the front. His chief of general staff, he did not allow him to do so. 
The meeting on July 13 began with Hitler's statement that the situation in Sicily, where the Western powers landed on July 10, has become serious. The Italians have not fought at all. We would probably lose the island. The enemy's next move could be to land in the Balkans or southern Italy. It is necessary to form new armies in Italy and the Western Balkans. Eastern Front must give up part of the forces, and therefore the Operation Citadel cannot last longer. Created, therefore, exactly the same situation, the possible occurrence of which I warned in Munich on May 4th, referring to the postponement of the Operation Citadel. Field Marshal von Kluge reported that Model's army cannot move forward and has already lost 20,000 men. In addition, the group is forced to take away all mobile units from the 9th Army to eliminate the deep breakthroughs made by the enemy already in three places on the front of the two Panzer Army. Already for this reason, the offensive of the 9th Army cannot continue and cannot then be resumed. On the contrary, I stated that as far as Group South is concerned, the battle has entered a decisive stage. After successfully repulsing the attacks of the enemy, who in recent days threw in the battle almost all of its operational reserves, victory is close. To stop the battle now would probably mean to miss the victory. If the Ninth Army will at least only restrain the opposing enemy forces and, perhaps, then resume the offensive, we will try to finally break the forces of our armies operating against us and already badly damaged enemy units. Then the group, as we have already reported July 12th, OK, will again advance northward, cross the cell east of Aboyan with two tank corps and then, turning westward, will force the enemy forces located in the western part of the Kursk Bulge to take the battle with an inverted front. And to effectively provide from the north and east of this operation, Kemp's group must now immediately get 24 TK. Naturally, the forces of the group will be enough only to continue the offensive to the area south of Kursk. If and after overcoming the crisis at the Oral Ark, the 9th Army will not be able to resume the offensive, we will at least try to break the enemy forces now operating against us, so that we can easily breathe. Otherwise, if we defeat the enemy only halfway, there will be an immediate crisis not only in the Donbass, but also on the Citadel front. Since Field Marshal von Kluge considered it impossible to resume the offensive of the 9th Army, and, moreover, considered it necessary to return it to the original positions, Hitler decided, at the same time taking into account the need to remove forces to transfer them to the Mediterranean Sea area, as to stop the implementation of the Operation Citadel. 24 TK in connection with the threat of an enemy offensive on the Donetsk front was subordinated to the group, but not for its free use. Hitler still agreed that the Group South should try to break the enemy units operating on its front, and thus create an opportunity to remove forces from the front citadel. After my return to the headquarters of the group, and a meeting with both commanders of the armies on July 16th, orders were issued, according to which we were to strike the enemy, before the end of the battle in the Kursk Bulge. The 4th Tank Army had the task two short blows to the north and west, to finally smash the enemy units located south of Seoul. Kemp's army group was to cover these attacks, acting in the eastern direction, and at the same time, interacting with the 4th Army to destroy the enemy grouping surrounded at the junction between the two armies. Then the command of the group assumed to withdraw both armies to the original positions, slightly improved due to the nature of the terrain to free up the necessary forces. Whether it would still be possible to defeat by a strike of tanks in the western direction facing the front of 52 AC enemy forces depended on the situation. We asked the 4th Air Fleet, which was unable to operate in the area of Citadel in these days due to bad weather conditions, to transfer its actions to the area of the front on the Mayas and Donuts so that it could disrupt the enemy's preparations for an offensive scene there. Unfortunately, nothing came of these plans. On July 17th, the OCO ordered the immediate withdrawal of the entire 2TTKSS and put it at its disposal, and on July 18th it demanded that the other two tank divisions be transferred to the disposal of Group Centre. Due to this reduction of forces, the Group Command was forced to abandon the planned strikes, halt operations and return the armies to their original positions. On July 17th, the enemy, as expected, launched an offensive on the Donetsk and Miosko fronts. On the section of the 6th and 1st tank armies, the enemy realised significant, albeit local, breakthroughs. In connection with this situation, the group command managed to hold at least for use in the Donbass area, 
along with the 24 TK, turned already in the Donbass and the SS Panzerkorps, intended by Hitler for Italy. If, therefore, the group command was forced to stop the battle before its end, perhaps just before the victory, at least on our front, we still managed to inflict serious blows to the enemy. We managed, at least partially, to defeat, along with the enemy's rifle divisions and tank brigades, which were on this front from the very beginning, also a large number of mobile formations of his operational reserves located in the Kursk Bulge area and in front of the Kharkov front. In total, against the armies of our group stood 11 tank and mechanized corps and 30 rifle divisions. They lost about 34,000 prisoners. The number of killed reached approximately 17, triple zero. If calculated in a favorable light for the enemy, then to this we must also add double the number of wounded, so that the total enemy losses were about 85, triple zero people. The losses of both German armies amounted to 20,720 men, including 3,330 killed. All divisions, with the exception of one panzer division, remained combat ready, although some of them, namely some infantry divisions, suffered considerable losses. The failure of Operation Citadel can be attributed to many reasons, chief among which was the lack of a moment of surprise. Despite false regroupings and camouflage measures, the offensive did not catch the enemy unprepared. But we would be wrong if we saw the reasons for the failure mainly in the tactical sphere. Operation Citadel was terminated by the German High Command even before the outcome of the battle for the following reasons first, due to the strategic influence of other theatres of operations or other fronts, and only secondly due to tactical failure, namely the stoppage of the offensive of the Ninth Army, which called into question at least the rapid achievement of the outcome of the battle. Both factors could have been foreseen or avoided. If the German High Command in the spring of 1943 would have made a clear conclusion from the general situation that it was necessary to throw all forces in order to achieve a draw in the east of the war, or at least to deplete the striking power of the Soviets. At the same time, it was also to act in accordance with this decision, determining the necessary number of forces and timing. With regard to the number of troops, we would need a small effort, mainly at the expense of infantry divisions, to ensure the success of the offensive of the Ninth Army, as well as to facilitate the first strike of Army Group South, and thereby accelerate the success of the battle. It would also be sufficient to reinforce the front of the Second Panzer Army to such an extent that the enemy could not, at least, quickly achieve success here, threatening the rear of the Ninth Army. The forces for this reinforcement could obviously be found in the so-called theatres of war of the OKW. This could be done, of course, only at the expense of significant risk in Norway, France and the Balkans, as well as the timely evacuation of North Africa, where it was already impossible to supply the army operating there. Hitler, on the other hand, did not dare to take this risk and the abandonment of the territory of Africa. He might have done so if he had been able to foresee the mistakes that the Western powers would make. These mistakes were that they engaged in waging war on German civilians through terrorist air raids for another year before launching decisive invasion operations, and that they advanced their second front after landing in southern Italy along the entire Italian boot. Instead of taking advantage of the more favourable operational opportunities afforded them by complete dominance at sea and in the air. If we talk about timing, the conduct of the Operation Citadel already at the end of May or at the latest in early June would have excluded. In any case, the coincidence of its coincidence with the landing of the enemy on the continent. In addition, the enemy would not have been fully restored combat effectiveness. If the German command had also taken into account my conclusions regarding the use of troops, then even with the then inevitable refusal to increase the number of tanks, we would have achieved for the Operation Citadel superiority in forces quite sufficient to achieve victory. Thus, the failure of Operation Citadel is explained by the fact that the German command tried to avoid the risk in terms of the number of troops and the time at which it had to take if it wanted to ensure the success of this last major German offensive operation in the East. The troops as well as their commanders are not to blame for this failure. They have once again shown themselves to be at their best. A comparison of the casualty figures of both sides shows how far our troops outclass the enemy. It is needless to say whether the retaliatory strike originally proposed by the Army Group South Command 
would have led to a better result. Since the Soviets did indeed delay until mid-July with their offensive, the idea of a preemptive strike, at any rate, was not false. It can also be assumed that the Soviets would have launched their offensive in any case no later than the summer of 1943, as their allies insisted. With the cessation of Operation Citadel, the initiative in the Eastern Theatre of Operations finally passed to the Soviets. After we failed to encircle large enemy forces in the Kursk Bulge area, and we had to stop the battle with the enemy's operational reserves thrown into battle even before the decisive moment of the operation, the factor of superiority of forces inevitably began to operate. The enemy offensive at the Oral Bulge was only the beginning of the transition to a major offensive. As could be expected, the main direction of their operations during the second half of 1944, and until the onset of the early spring thaw in 1944, the Soviets chose the southern flank of the eastern flank as the main direction of their operations. The Soviets chose the southern flank of the eastern front, the section of army group south. I have already mentioned the operational, military, economic and political reasons for this choice. The fact that the enemy later included in this decisive operation and the southern flank of army group centre was dictated by the situation and the grouping of his forces at the time of the end of Operation Citadel. The other individual strikes which the Soviets then made in the area of operations of group centre were intended, like the offensive against Army Group A at the Kuban Bridgehead, primarily to prevent the German command from concentrating its forces in the area of Group South. In any case, it would hardly be a mistake if we assume that, assume that the Soviet command in the second half of 1944 set as its goal to achieve what it failed to realise in the winter of 1942-43 the destruction of Army Group South and at the same time Group A on the shores of the Azov, or Black Sea. This success could have a decisive influence on the situation on the entire Eastern Front and open the way to the Balkans for the Soviets. To prevent this enemy success was the goal of the battles fought by Group South from the time of the termination of Operation Citadel until the onset of the Thaw period in the spring of 1944. Army Group later took part in these battles, as well as the southern flank of Army Group Centre. Before proceeding to the description of the course of this campaign, fragmentary and compressed due to the abundance of events, it is necessary to show the conditions in which the command of the group and the subordinate armies had to conduct these battles. The following conditions were decisive for the course of this campaign. The colossal numerical superiority of the enemy, both in number of formations and, to an ever-increasing degree, in armament and the advantage of the Russian command, which was not bound, like the army group command, in its actions, as a result of the fact that the German high command gave priority to political and military economic considerations over operational objectives. Superiority in forces on the Soviet side in the area of operations of army group south which was already colossal by the end of Operation Citadel. As of July 17th, 1944, 29 infantry and 13 tank and motorised divisions of the group were opposed by 109 Soviet infantry divisions, 9 infantry brigades, 10 tank corps in addition, 20 separate tank brigades, 16 tank regiments and 8 anti-tank fighter brigades. Up to September 7th, 55 more rifle divisions, two tank and mechanised corp, eight tank brigades and twelve tank regiments were fixed in front of the group front, transferred here mainly from reserves or from the front sections in front of the group centre and north. The ratio of forces was approximately 7-1 in favour of the Soviets. This numerical superiority made it possible for the Soviets to attack, not only in one, but often in many areas at the same time, having an overwhelming superiority of forces. It allowed the enemy to make up for his often heavy losses surprisingly quickly. Thus, in front of the front of the group, the enemy was able only for the period from early July to September to withdraw from the front to rest once, and partly even twice 48 rifle divisions, 17 tank and mechanised corps, and, in addition, monthly to give all divisions 10% replenishment. We certainly did not expect from the Soviet side such great organisational abilities, which it showed in this matter, as well as in the deployment of its military industry. We have met a hydra, which in place of one severed head grows two new ones. On the contrary, in the area of operations of the group was rarely possible to withdraw to rest battle-worn divisions. Since the beginning of Operation Citadel, 
Almost all divisions were in combat all the time. The incoming replenishment of personnel and equipment did not even approximately cover the losses. In these conditions, the overstretch of troops became increasingly strong, the expenditure of forces rapidly increased. This is especially true for the core of the troops, the experienced frontline soldiers and officers. By the end of August, only our group lost seven division commanders, 38 regimental commanders, and 252 battalion commanders. One has to wonder all the time what, in spite of this, the German troops have achieved, and the fact that they in their fighting qualities have always held superiority over the enemy. The need to always demand this from the troops, because there was no other way, meant for the commanders much greater moral torment than the need to survive the inevitable crises. It goes without saying that the group command in its reports always unfolded before Hitler an unvarnished picture of these conditions and always pointed out the danger of prolonged overstretching of the troops. But our resources were running out. However willing the German people were then to send their sons to the front, the replenishment was not enough. No matter how amazing was the energy with which Hitler organised the increase in war production, still it could not compare with the scale of the increase in production of the enemy. If we in the second half of 1944 could produce about 500 tanks per month, the Soviet war industry was producing several times more. We are not talking about deliveries from the Western powers. Despite this, the group commanders firmly believed that we would still, after all, eventually succeed in stopping the onslaught of the Eastern masses. In addition to our just faith in the superiority of the German soldier should be said here and the experience we took into account in the winter campaign of 1942-43, which we were able to successfully complete, despite the most severe crises. In addition, according to the calculations of the OK, it was possible to assume that the human resources of the Soviet Union would gradually run out. The reserves of older ages, from which it drew its strength for its new formations, seemed for the most part already to have been used up. If only the new conscript age remained as replenishment for the front, the enemy could no longer create new formations on a large scale, although the Soviet conscript age exceeded the German by a minimum of three times the number of mobilised men. But this superiority we hoped to withstand and exhaust the enemy's offensive force. The prerequisite for the success of our operations was, it is true, that they were organised or, more correctly, could be organised in a way that met the requirements of the operational situation. In this respect, however, the group command during the campaign of 1943 to 1944 was at all times in an unfavourable position, which fatefully limited its operational capabilities. If the Soviet command, which was obvious, was looking for a decisive victory in this campaign in the area of operations of the South Group, then there was nothing else for us but to prepare for this battle as best as possible. The fighting had to be organised in such a way as to frustrate the enemy's plans. For this purpose, two things were necessary in the area of operations of the Group South, had to fight in accordance with the operational requirements of the situation and aim to deplete the striking force of the enemy, but not to hold any areas at any cost. The German command had to finally choose now the decisive theatre of operations in the general conduct of the war in the East, and within the Eastern Front it had to be foreseen that the main efforts should be concentrated in the area of operations of the Group South. With regard to both of these conditions, the Group Command waged during the 1943 to 1944 campaign a continuous struggle with Hitler for the recognition of the requirements arising from the operational situation. For political and military economic reasons, Hitler insisted on holding first the Donbass and then the Dnieper Ark. Thus the Group South with its right flank first on the Mayas and Donitz, then on the bend of the Dnieper was, so to speak, chained to the area, the retention of which from the operational point of view was a mistake. Cutting far to the east into the enemy front, this area gave the enemy the opportunity to conduct an offensive from two sides, and our armies had in the rear of the sea. But the most important thing was that as a result of holding these protruding bastions, the length of the front, on the section of the group increased in fatal for us. For the defence of this section we had to use forces without which we simply could not do without on the northern flank of the army group. But just here, and not in the Donets or Dnieper area, was the key to solving the operational problem. If the Soviets had succeeded in defeating the northern flank of the group, 
using their overwhelming superiority and strength, it would have achieved their goal of encircling the groups South and A at the Black Sea. This defeat would be the stronger, the more forces for military, economic or political reasons would be concentrated on the southern flank of the group, operationally not decisive. It was, therefore, simply a question of whether operational or military, economic and political considerations were decisive for operations on the German southern flank. Practically speaking, the way the situation now developed meant the following either we would, if necessary, voluntarily give up the Donets and Dnieper, or, in an attempt to hold these areas at any cost, we must sacrifice the groups South and A. In order to make this question absolutely clear, the command of Group South already on July 21st, and repeatedly thereafter asked the German High Command for clear operational instructions for a longer period of time. We wanted to know precisely whether the group should, under all circumstances, hold the Donbass, even if there was a threat of encirclement as a result of an enemy breakthrough in the direction of the Dnieper, or whether we should count on the fact that the Russians would exhaust their forces in the summer. In this case, it was necessary to withdraw step by step in the Donbass, if necessary, in order to free up enough forces for the northern flank. The answer we received to this question from the Chief of the General Staff stated the Fuhrer wants both as was often the case, Hitler, and this time believed that his will will be stronger than the actual facts. With regard to the distribution of forces, it must be said that whoever does not dare to give up territory in order to preserve forces in case of necessity, he will not be able to become strong in the decisive area. The more Hitler insisted from the point of view of the general conduct of the war, perhaps rightly so on holding the Donbass or the Dini per bend, the more it was necessary to strengthen the northern flank of Group South in advance. Only this could be achieved in order to thwart the decisive breakthrough of the enemy in order to encircle the Group South and at the Black Sea and for access to the Balkans. It is clear that this was possible only at the expense of other theatres of war or sections of army groups north and centre. If we intended to wait until the enemy proved by his successes the need to concentrate the main efforts in the band of army group south, we had to take into account that it could be too late. But such a conduct of operations hindered those views and qualities of Hitler, which I have already discussed in the chapter Hitler Supreme Commander, namely his desire to pursue always simultaneously several goals, his negative attitude to give anything voluntarily or to take into account in advance, independent of his will of the enemy command, and finally the constant postponement of necessary but undesirable for him decisions. Thus he opposed both the timely abandonment of the Donbass and measures to free up forces for the decisive area by levelling the front line in the less important parts of the front, undertaken in a timely manner, even before it is forced by the enemy. Instead, Hitler even kept the 17th Army on the Cuban bridgehead, which, from an operational point of view, was no longer needed at all, in the vain hope that the Soviets would view the army's presence there as a strategic threat. In the summer of 1944, Hitler clearly did not have a clear decision on the main direction of military operations, both within the Eastern Front and on the scale of the leadership of all military operations. As early as mid-August, when the situation on the Eastern Front was already becoming quite difficult, Hitler told the Chief of the General Staff that for him the South, the Mediterranean area, is more important than the East, that he intended, therefore, was to withdraw some forces from the Eastern Front and move them to Italy. If he held this clearly erroneous view, in that case he should have reorganised his entire strategy as early as the spring of 1944, to strive for a political draw in the war in the East, taking advantage of the situation created by the Soviet failures in February and March, was as necessary as a timely evacuation from North Africa was necessary for the defence of Italy and the Balkans. Instead, the German high command in this campaign of 1943 to 1944 was late compared to the enemy with the concentration of sufficient forces on the decisive section of the Eastern Front. This did not give the group commanders the opportunity to prevent the successes of superior enemy forces, he managed only to limit their operational consequences. The command was in worse conditions than the enemy it was limited in its operational freedom. It was, on the one hand, chained to the Donbass, and on the other hand did not have enough forces for the operationally important northern flank. It was forced to use a large part of its formations in an area wrongly chosen from the operational point of view to hold the Donbass and later the Dnieper bend. At the same time, 
it had to move units from one flank to the other at all times in order to restore the situation to some extent in one area or to prevent a dangerous crisis without being able at the same time to prevent superior enemy forces from making gains in other areas at that time. After the end of Operation Citadel, Group South turned to defensive fighting, which under the conditions I have mentioned was nothing more than a system of measures that only helped to get out of the situation. For passive defensive fighting with significantly superior enemy forces on the entire stretched front, our group was very weak. It had to, therefore, despite the danger of strikes in less threatened areas, timely concentrate forces where it was necessary to prevent an enemy breakthrough or where it was possible to strike the enemy. We had to avoid at all costs the danger expressed in the fact that our units as a result of deep enemy breakthroughs could be cut off and could share the fate of the 6th Army at Stalingrad. The point of our fighting was to hold on the battlefield and force the enemy to use up as much of his striking force as possible. The first blow of the enemy was struck, as we expected, on the section of the front in the Donbass. On July 17th, the enemy, as we have already mentioned, began an offensive with large forces against the 6th Army on the Mayas against the 1st Tank Army on the Middle Donets. In both areas he deeply cut into our defences, but he failed to make a breakthrough. The 6th Army, bringing into battle both mobile units left as a reserve in the Donets area, was able to stop the enemy's advance after he captured a bridgehead about 20 km wide and 15 km deep on the west bank of the Mayas north of Kubishev. On the section of the 1st Tank Army, the enemy managed to force the Donets southeast of Isium in a strip of up to 30 km. But thanks to the introduction into the battle of both divisions of the 24th Tank Army, which came up from Kharkov, we stopped the further advance of the enemy south of the river. If we managed to stop the enemy offensive at the end of July, the situation in the Donbass remained very unstable. After the Operation Citadel by order of Hitler on July 17th, was finally terminated also the group south. The command of the group decided to remove temporarily from this flank of the large tank forces to restore the situation in the Donbass with the help of these units. We hoped in the course of Operation Citadel to defeat the enemy enough to count on a certain respite on this front. However, this hope was then fatal for the development of the situation on the northern flank of the group, because the enemy launched an offensive earlier than we expected. If it was, therefore, a mistake, it was due to the position of Hitler, claiming that it is absolutely necessary to hold the Donbass. The temporary weakening of the northern flank, caused by this decision, was practically limited only to the removal from the front 3TK and 3TD, as Hitler knew returned to the disposal of the group for a counterattack in the Donbass SS Tank Corp, which he intended for Italy. Since both corps and four panzer divisions intended for Donbass could arrive only in turn, the group command assumed to restore the situation in the area of the 1st Panzer Army south of the Donitz by a short strike of two divisions of the 1st Echelon of the SS Corp. With a blow of all tank forces, we were then to eliminate a large enemy bridgehead in the band of the 6th Army and again restore the front on the Mayas. Hitler, however, without any explanation, forbade the operation in the strip of the 1st Panzer Army, although these actions in no way prolonged the stay of the corps in the Donbass. Since this interference in the affairs of the group command was preceded by another interference during Operation Citadel, I was forced to protest in the OK against such interference in the command of the group. I wrote to General Zeitzler. If my opinion about the future development of events is not taken into account, if my plans, aimed only at eliminating the complications in the situation that arose through no fault of my own, are constantly thwarted, then I can only conclude that the Führer does not have the necessary confidence in the command of the group. I by no means think that I have never made mistakes. Every man makes mistakes, even such commanders as Frederick the Great and Napoleon. But I will allow myself to point out that the 11th Army in very difficult conditions won the Crimean campaign, and that Army Group South, which fell at the end of last year, almost in a hopeless situation, still managed to get out of it. If the Führer believes that any of his army commanders or army group commanders has stronger nerves than we had in the battles of last winter, will show more initiative than we did in the Crimea, on the Donets, and at Kharkov, who can find a way out better than we did in the battles for the Crimea, or in the last winter campaign, or better anticipates the course of events than we did, then I am ready to willingly give him my post. But as long as I hold this post, 
I must be able to think with my head. July 30th in the area of action of the 6th Army began a counter-attack of tanks that approached from the northern flank of the group. It led to a complete restoration of the position at the boundary of the Mayas. The ratio of forces in this battle was typical for the then situation, but it also once again showed the superiority of the German army. The enemy had on its bridgehead no less than 16 infantry divisions, two mechanized corps, one tank brigade and two anti-tank fighter brigades. Our counter-attack, on the other hand, involved only four tank divisions, one motorized division and two infantry divisions. As a result of their attacks and the German counterattack, the enemy lost about 18,000 prisoners, 700 tanks, 200 guns and 400 anti-tank guns. The Battle West of Belgorod and the Battle for Kharkov If in the first days of August we were thus able to restore the situation in the Donbass, in the area of action of the 6th Army, the wound in the band of the 1st Tank Army on the Donets still continued to worry us. This wound could not be healed because at this time a storm was gathering on the northern flank of the group. The enemy was heavily crowding already Kempf's group and the 4th Tank Army when they were withdrawn to their original positions even before the start of Operation Citadel. Radio and air reconnaissance at the end of the month showed that the enemy was concentrating large tank forces in the Kursk Bulge area, apparently pulling up fresh forces from the central section. Preparations for an offensive were also noted in the Donitz bend southeast of Kharkov, on August 2nd, the group's command reported to the OK that it expected soon to launch an enemy offensive against its northern section of the front west of Belgorod. This offensive will apparently be supplemented by an offensive southeast of Kharkov, pursuing the goal of taking in pincers our troops in the area of Kharkov and free the way to the Dnieper. The group command asked to return to him both tank divisions, given to the group centre, and leave the SS Panzer Corps for use on the northern flank. It ordered, in addition, to return 3TK with 3TT from Donbass to Kharkov. On August 3rd, the enemy offensive began, first on the front of the 4th Tank Army and on the section of Kemp's group west of Belgorod. The enemy managed to realise a breakthrough at the junction of both armies and significantly expand it in depth and width in the following days. 4 Tank Army was pushed westward, Kemp's group to the south, towards Kharkov. Already on August 8th, the gap between the two armies reached 55 km northwest of Kharkov. The way to Poltava and further to the Dnieper was apparently open for the enemy. The command of the group decided to pull up to Kharkov 3 TK. It was to be used by Kemp's group to hit the eastern flank of the enemy's breakthrough wedge. At the same time on the western flank was to strike the 4th Tank Army with the forces of two armoured divisions returned by the group centre and one motorised division. But it was clear that these forces, and in general the forces of the group, could not be further held the front line. The losses of our divisions reached very alarming proportions. Due to prolonged overstretch, two divisions could not continue the battle. Due to the rapid advance of the enemy, we also lost a large number of tanks that were in repair shops behind the front line. The enemy, however, was able, apparently faster than we expected, to make up for his losses suffered during Operation Citadel. But above all, he pulled up large new forces from other fronts. It was quite clear that, as we had envisioned, the enemy decided to succeed in the section of the group south. This was clear not only because he was throwing all new forces to the breakthrough area, but also because we had to expect an enemy offensive on our front to the east and southeast of Kharkov. At the same time, the enemy's intentions to conduct an offensive on the Donets and Mayas were again revealed. When the chief of the general staff came to us on August 8th to clarify the situation here, I told him quite clearly that now it could not be a question of individual questions. The question now was not whether we could in any way release this, or that division for the South Group, or whether we should or should not leave the Cuban bridgehead. The point was now to make every effort to prevent the enemy from achieving his goal to destroy the southern flank of the German army. If we want to achieve this goal, we must immediately give Donbass to free up forces for the northern flank of the group and in the south to hold at least the Dnieper. Otherwise, it is necessary for the OK to pull up as quickly as possible to the Dnieper from other fronts, at least ten divisions to the section of the 4th Panzer Army and northward to the section of the neighbouring 2nd Army of Group Centre and another ten divisions toward the Dnieper. This time, however, no cardinal measures were taken. 
although the group command persistently and repeatedly asked for a decision on this issue. The situation, however, was getting more and more aggravated. The enemy even more pressed to the west of the 4th Tank Army and intended to simultaneously bypass Kemp's group from the west in the gap made by him to surround it in Kharkov. On August 12th, he launched attacks on our front east and southeast of Kharkov. The divisions there on a very wide front could not withstand the enemy's onslaught, threatening looming danger of encirclement of Kemp's group in the Kharkov area. As always, Hitler demanded under all circumstances to hold the city. The fall of this city, he declared, could adversely affect the position of Turkey and Bulgaria. Let it be so, but the command of the group was not going to sacrifice the army in the battle for Kharkov. August 22nd Kharkov was surrendered in order to free up forces for both threatened flanks of Kemp's group and prevent its encirclement. Command of this group, renamed 8th Army, was assumed at this time by my former Chief of Staff, General Wheeler. I worked well with General Kemp Hef. But against this change made on Hitler's instructions, I did not object. In this situation especially valuable were the calmness and prudence of Wheeler, shown by him more than once in the Crimea in times of severe crises. Otherwise, August 22nd was clearly a day of crisis. In the Donbass, the enemy attacked us again. Although the 6th Army was able to contain a dangerous enemy breakthrough, it lacked the strength to restore the position again. At the sight of the 1st Tank Army, a new major enemy offensive was stopped, but its forces were also exhausted. While the 8th Army evacuated Kharkov without losses, the 4th Tank Army, which had been fighting hard on its southern flank, achieved success in defence. As a result of the active use of the previously mentioned tank formations taken from the Donbass and from the front of the centre group, we still managed by August 23rd, at least temporarily, to stop the enemy's breakthrough to Poltava. The front was again restored, although still weak and with many gaps, in the strip of the 8th and 4th tank armies from a point immediately south of Kharkov to the area southwest of Aktyuka. Despite the fact that maintained communication between the 4th Panzer Division and the left flank of the group centre, however, there was a wide gap on the front of the 4th Tank Army southwest of Aktyurka. It was eliminated at the end of the month as a result of our offensive and simultaneous levelling of the front line. Against what superior enemy forces both armies of our group had to fight the situation on August 23rd showed. Against the front of the 4th Tank Army, the enemy had three armies on the Voronezh front, including one tank army, and the 4th Army was apparently in the second echelon. Against the 8th Army acted step front with no less than six armies, including one tank army. To assess the overall situation at the front of the army group is very instructive, is a comparison of the forces of both sides in some parts of the front with an indication of the width of the front. This summary the group command on August 2021 submitted to the Oak. Combinations front width number of divisions capability number of enemy compounds in front of the front of the army 6 army 250 kilometers, 10 infantry divisions. 1 tank division 31 slash 3 divisions, a half division 31 rifle divisions, 2 mech, corps, 7 tank brigades, 7 tank regiments. Total about 400 tanks, 1 tank army, 250 kilometers, 8 infantry divisions, 3 tank divisions and motorized divisions 51 slash 2 divisions, 1 and 1 fourth divisions, 32 infantry divisions, 1 tank corps, 1 mech corps, 1 tank brigade, 6 tank regiments, one cavalry corps. Total about 220 tanks, 8 army, 210 kilometers, 12 infantry divisions, 5 tank divisions, 53 slash 4 divisions, 21 slash 3 divisions, 44 to 55 rifle divisions, 3 mech corps, 3 tank corps, 11 tank brigades, 16 tank regiments. Total about 360 tanks, 4 tank army, 270 kilometers, 8 infantry divisions, 5 tank divisions, 31 slash 3 divisions, 21 slash 3 divisions, 20 to 22 rifle divisions, 1 mech corps, 5 tank corps, 1 tank brigade, 2 tank regiments. Total about 490 tanks group, as a whole 980 kilometers, 38 infantry divisions, 14 armoured divisions, in assessing the combat effectiveness of enemy units, we proceeded from the fact that the bulk of rifle and tank formations still have 30 to 50 percent of the regular composition. A small number of new divisions and some tank and mechanized corps could have 70 to 80 percent of the regular composition. No doubt, the enemy suffered very heavy losses, 
and therefore the reduction in the combat effectiveness of its compounds was approximately the same as ours. What we could not compensate for was the superiority of the enemy in the number of compounds. In addition, the enemy had to pull up new forces from the Oral Front in the coming days. The table further shows that the enemy persistently threw all his forces on the northern flank of the group. His intention under all circumstances to make a breakthrough to the Dnieper is clearly evident from the concentration of forces in front of the front of the 8th Army and the right flank of the 4th Tank Army. Subsequently, the enemy increased its forces by pulling up new units in order to realise the coverage of the 4th Panzer Army from the north and pushing it away from Kiev. But from this table also shows that the number of compounds of the group south since the beginning of the Operation Citadel increased very slightly compared to the above-mentioned reinforcements of the enemy. Until the end of August we received nine infantry and one armoured division. Of these, however, four infantry divisions we gave seven AC, which moved to the northern flank of the group centre in the four-tank army. Since as a result of this front of this army increased by 120 kilometres, these four divisions, in essence, did not mean an increase in forces. Still, we received an additional five infantry and one tank division. If we had them before the start of Operation Citadel, this circumstance could at least accelerate the first success and significantly affect the course of the battle in our favour. There is no question that it was easier to release these divisions then than after Operation Citadel, when the situation in all areas became more tense. The big battle on the entire front of the group. If before August 27th, on the northern flank of the army group from Kharkov to Sumy created some detent, although of course very short due to the restoration of a solid front to some extent, the situation in the Donbass became increasingly threatening. Therefore, the group command categorically demanded either with the former task to allocate additional forces or to give freedom of manoeuvre on the southern flank to stop the enemy on the shorter rear of the front. Because of this demand, Hitler finally decided to come from his headquarters in East Prussia to the south for a short meeting. The meeting was held on August 27th in Vinitsa, in his former headquarters. At this meeting I and the commanders of the subordinate armies, as well as one corps commander and one division commander reported to Hitler the situation and above all the condition of the units, long since exhausted in continuous fighting. I especially pointed out that our losses amounted to 133,000 men and we received as a replenishment of only 33,000 people. If the enemy's fighting ability and weakened, still the large number of compounds gives him the opportunity to constantly throw into battle combat capable divisions. In addition, he continues to throw up forces from other parts of the Eastern Front. From this situation I concluded that we cannot hold the Donbass with the forces we have and that even greater danger to the entire southern flank of the eastern front created on the northern flank of the group. Eight and four panzer armies are not able to long to hold back the onslaught of the enemy in the direction to the Dnieper. I gave Hitler a clear alternative. Either to quickly allocate us new forces, at least twelve divisions, and replace our weakened units with units from other quiet sections of the front, or give up Donbass to free up forces on the group front. Hitler, who conducted this meeting in a very businesslike tone, although he tried to delve, as always, in technical details, still agreed that the Group South requires serious support. He promised that he would give us from the fronts of the Group's North, and centre all the connections that can only take from there. He also promised to find out in the next few days the possibility of replacing divisions weakened in the fighting divisions from more peaceful parts of the front. Already in the next few days it became clear to us that things would not go further than these promises. The Soviets attacked the left flank of the group centre and carried out a private breakthrough, as a result of which this army was forced to withdraw to the west. In the strip of the fourth army of this group, as a result of the successful enemy offensive, a critical situation also arose. On August 28th, Field Marshal von Kluge arrived at the Führer's headquarters and reported that it was out of the question to withdraw forces from his section of the front. Group North also could not allocate a single division. Regarding other theatres of war, Hitler intended first to wait for further developments, that is to wait to see whether the British would land in Apulia or the Balkans, or which was as improbable as it was irrelevant, whether they would tie up their forces in Sardinia. 
Unfortunately, the Soviets did not consider Hitler's willingness to wait to make a decision. They continued to advance. The situation was becoming increasingly critical. The Sixth Army's front was broken through its corps operating on the coast was threatened with encirclement. Two divisions, which even earlier contrary to the intention of the group command to use them on the northern flank, were transferred to Donbass, could not restore the situation. The group command ordered therefore on August 31st to withdraw the Sixth Army to a previously prepared rear position. This was the first step towards the surrender of Donbass. In the evening of the same day, Hitler finally allowed the group command to gradually withdraw the 6th Army and the right flank of the 1st Panzer Army, if the situation urgently requires it, and there is no other possibility. An order was given to destroy all militarily important facilities in the Donbass. If this freedom of manoeuvre had been given to us a few weeks earlier, the group would have had the opportunity to fight on its southern flank with greater economy of forces. In that case, the group could have freed up units for use on the decisive northern flank and, despite this, could have stopped the enemy's advance in the south on a shorter front, perhaps even in front of the Dnieper. Now it could only save the southern flank from defeat. However, it was still questionable whether we could create a solid defence in front of the Dnieper. While the first tank army held the line along the middle Donets, except in those areas where its right flank was to be reduced due to the withdrawal of the 6th Army, the situation on the northern flank of the group again aggravated. The 8th Army, attacked in the area south of Kharkov from the north and east, was able to prevent an enemy breakthrough, albeit as a result of a minor withdrawal and the resulting reduction of its front. As a result of the withdrawal of the neighbouring right 2 Army of the centre group 4 Panzer Army was forced to bend its left flank, its already weak front was further enlarged. Located in the southernmost section of the Second Army, its 13th AC, due to poor management, retreated southward into the area of operations of the tank army, resulting in another front of 90 km, stretched to the north and held by four more or less shattered divisions. It was already foreseeable that the army is unlikely to withstand the next onslaught of the enemy, if the enemy, whose offensive impulse has so far weakened, will again begin the offensive with fresh forces especially since now there was a threat to its northern flank, further aggravation of the situation, and, above all, Hitler's slowness in deciding on the allocation of reinforcements forced me to fly to the Führer's headquarters in East Prussia on September 3rd. I asked Field Marshal von Kluge to come there as well. I wanted to clarify with him the question of the distribution of forces in view of the enemy's offensive plans. At the same time we wanted to discuss the need for a reasonable strategy, that is, to eliminate the ambiguity in the division of the theatres of war into the theatres of war of theatres of war of the OKB and the Eastern Front. The day before, in a letter to General Zeitzler, I had demanded that cardinal measures should finally be taken to concentrate the main efforts on the decisive section of the Eastern Front. In view of the possible development of events on the inner flanks of the group's south and centre, it was necessary to concentrate in advance one strong army in front of Kiev. If we wait with the transfer of forces from other theatres of war until the western enemy somewhere to land, it will be too late for the eastern front. In general, it is not so difficult to recognise on the grouping of forces of the navy and transport ships of the enemy his main intentions, that is, where there is a threat of landing. Zeitzler gave to read this letter to Hitler. As he told me, the letter caused Hitler an explosion of rage. He declared that I wanted to conduct only ingenious operations and be vindicated in the annals of warfare. What can be said about these naive statements? The conversation between Hitler, Field Marshal von Kluge and me remained, unfortunately, inconclusive. Hitler stated that it is impossible to remove forces from other theatres of war, nor from the front of the group centre. Hitler was also absolutely negative to the question of creating a unified command by transferring responsibility for all theatres of war to the chief of the general staff. He argued that, and his influence could not change or improve anything in the overall strategy. Of course, Hitler perfectly understood that the proposal for a chief of the general staff, responsible for all theatres of war, was aimed at Hitler to retain only the right to make the final decision, but gave up the leadership of operations. But to this he could not agree, just as he could not agree to give up the leadership of operations on the Eastern Front by appointing a commander of the Eastern Front. Since in the following days the OK did not take any measures that would take into account the situation on the front of the Group South, 
I again reported by telegram of September 7th, the situation on the front of the group. I pointed out that the enemy had already put into battle against our Group 55 divisions and two tank corps, taken not from reserves, but in large part from other parts of the Eastern Front. In addition, new units were still on their way. I once again demanded urgent cardinal measures from the OK in order that we could hold the front on the section of our group. Soon on September 8th, Hitler arrived at our headquarters in Zaporozhye, where he ordered the commander of Group A Field Marshal von Kleist and Colonel General Ruf, whose 17th Army was still in the Kuban. At this meeting I once again very emphatically pointed out the seriousness of the situation of the group, the state of the troops, and the consequences that threaten not only the Group South, but also the Group A in the event of a defeat of the northern flank of our group. I stated that we can no longer restore the position on the right flank of the group in front of the Dnieper. The enemy managed to break a gap on the northern flank of the 6th Army 45 km wide, where only the remnants of two of our divisions fought. Counter-attacks with our small tank forces could not close this gap. Whether we want or not, we will be forced to withdraw behind the Dnieper, especially taking into account the possible consequences of the extremely tense situation on the northern flank of our group. To get the necessary forces to reinforce this flank, I propose to immediately withdraw the group centre on the Dnieper line. As a result, its front would be reduced by one-third, and we would save forces that would allow us to concentrate, finally large enough troop formations on the decisive section of the Eastern Front. Hitler now agreed in principle with the need to withdraw the northern flank of the group to the line Melitopol Dnieper, although he still hoped to avoid it by pulling up here new divisions of assault guns. As always, he thought that the use of technical means would be sufficient to stabilise the situation, which could be achieved in fact only by the introduction of a large number of new divisions into the battle. Regarding the release of forces from the area of group centre by withdrawal to the upper Dnieper, he stated, however, that a rapid withdrawal over such a long distance is not feasible. Such a large movement of units would be delayed until the onset of thaw. In addition, he believed that a lot of equipment would be lost. In general, a withdrawal to an intermediate line further east was, in his opinion, possible, but would not give us the necessary compensation in the form of savings of forces. All this hinged on the question of manoeuvre operations, on which the command of the Group South on the basis of its experience in the Crimea and the winter of 1942-43 took a fundamentally different position than the occasion commanders of other groups. In these campaigns we were forced to act quickly and promptly, and it was done without preliminary long planning and preparation. Hitler and other commanders believed that you could not start so quickly and carry out large movements of troops. True, the rapid conduct of the withdrawal from the front a long time firmly held, hampered by the fact that Hitler, in order to ensure the retention of terrain, even with a temporary interruption in the supply ordered to keep in the armies of three months' supply of material. If Hitler, therefore, still could not decide on such a big event, as was proposed by me to reduce the front line occupied by the group centre, he still recognised the need for a strong strengthening of the group south. At the suggestion of the chief of the general staff, he decided that the group centre immediately allocate one corps, consisting of two armoured and two infantry divisions at the junction between it and the 4th Tank Army. This should be prevented the danger of coverage of our northern flank. In addition, he agreed to fulfil my request to pull up another four divisions to provide crossings across the Dnieper. Finally, he decided in order to free up forces to leave the Kuban bridgehead, which had long ago lost any operational value. According to the report of Field Marshal von Kleist, this could be done by October 12th. Unfortunately, it was not possible to ensure that these orders were issued immediately, that is, still in our headquarters. But when I said goodbye to Hitler at the airfield, he before boarding the plane once again repeated his agreement to give us the promised forces. Even in the evening of this day, we gave the order to the 6th Army and 1st Panzer Army to move now to a mobile defence, which the armies should organise so as to ensure the resilience of the troops and to gain as much time as possible to implement the withdrawal. As for the fronts of the 8th Army and 4th Panzer Army, the group command hoped, if Hitler's promise was fulfilled, to restore the situation on the northern flank of the 4th Panzer Army by counter-attacking the corps transferred to us from the group centre. With the help of divisions approaching the Dnieper, 
we would be able to strengthen our front. Then there was an opportunity to stop the enemy on the northern flank in front of the Dnieper, approximately on the line of Poltava. In this case, a significant reduction of the front would be achieved not only for this situation, but also for the one that would arise if the group in the absence of reinforcements had to retreat on the entire front behind the Dnieper. Unfortunately, the next day brought us a new disappointment. The order promised to me by Hitler on his departure to allocate four divisions for use on the Dnieper frontier never came. The concentration of the corps on our northern flank was delayed by group centre. It was unknown when and in what composition it would actually arrive. I asked the Chief of the General Staff to report to the Führer that under such circumstances we would have to reckon with the possibility of enemy breakthroughs to the Dnieper crossings, including Kiev, in view of the constantly delayed decision of the High Command and the failure to fulfil the promises on which the Group Command based its plans, I found it necessary to add to this report a paragraph which could only be stated in writing. I will quote it here verbatim, as it clearly shows the disagreement between the General Command and the Group Command. The group command after the end of the winter fighting reported that it would not be able to hold its defence front with the available forces, and repeatedly, but in vain, raised the question of the necessary regrouping of forces within the Eastern Front, or at the expense of other theatres of war, which was inevitable in view of the importance of the area defended by it, and the certain fact that the Russians will choose the main direction of their offensive the section of the group south. Instead, after the end of Operation Citadel, it was taken away from the forces, and after the crisis came reinforcements were given to it in insufficient quantities and late. If we had received the reinforcements required by the situation in time, we could have avoided the present crisis, which may decide the outcome of the war in the East and consequently the whole war. I write this not to say that now late to talk about responsibility for this development of events in the East, but so that at least in the future, in time to do everything necessary. Hitler apparently hesitated whether to take a decision, which in our opinion was absolutely necessary to withdraw army group centre on the line of the Dnieper in order to free up forces sufficient to save the situation on the southern wing of the Eastern Front. To induce him to take this decision could not persistent advice of the Chief of the Chief of the General Staff and the Operational Department of the OK, nor the new appeal of the headquarters of Army Group South. The latter stated that if the enemy, as Hitler feared, will launch an offensive on the front of Army Group Center, it will only be of a constraining nature. The enemy will try in this way to prevent us from concentrating large forces on the northern flank of Army Group South. As for the withdrawal of Army Group Center to the line of the Dnieper, it will have neither from the operational nor from the military economic point of view, will not have significant consequences. When, nevertheless, no decision was taken to form the grouping promised to us on the northern flank of Army Group Centre, and the enemy, on the other hand, was transferring more and more divisions against this flank, there was a danger of the 4th Panzer Army being covered from the north, as a result of which it would be pushed away from Kiev. This would not only deprive us of the opportunity to organise the defence on a new frontier behind the Dnieper, but also would greatly increase the threat of encirclement of the entire group of armies. Characterising this situation, the headquarters of the Army Group on September 14th reported that the next day he was forced to order the withdrawal of the northern flank of the Army Group behind the Dnieper on both sides of Kiev. Even before that, the 8th Army had received the order to move to manoeuvre defence. The thought of stopping the enemy's offensive on a shorter front in front of the Dnieper on the line passing through Poltava, due to Hitler's hesitations, became meaningless. In response to this report, it was pointed out to us that the order should not be given until Hitler had another conversation with me on September 15th. I replied that such a conversation could only be meaningful if I were allowed to speak to him alone, only in the presence of the chief of the general staff. During this conversation, I reported to Hitler that after his visit to the front, the situation had deteriorated. I told him that the crisis on the northern flank of the army group carries a mortal threat not only to it, but further and the Eastern Front as a whole. It is not only a question of the possibility of holding the Dnieper line or some other economically important areas, but the fate of the entire Eastern Front. I added that the crisis that has now occurred is a consequence of the fact that Army Group Centre did not give us the troops we asked for. For its part, the headquarters of Army Group South 
in a critical situation, has always loyally followed the orders of the OK to transfer troops to other army groups. It is difficult to understand why an exception is made for other army groups. In addition, there is no reason for this if Army Group Centre will soon withdraw to new lines. To hold the old positions in general makes no sense if the enemy succeeds in breaking through the front of the 4th Panzer Army. The situation in which the transfer of forces from one group of armies to another, the necessity of which is recognised by the General Command, as in this case with Army Group Centre, I consider completely abnormal. What will we achieve if the commanders do not follow orders anymore? I, at any rate, I am confident that I will always achieve the fulfilment of my orders. I ended my report to Hitler by expressing doubt whether the 4th Panzer Army will be able to withdraw behind the Dnieper. Of course, the army group will do everything to ensure that this operation went smoothly. For this purpose, however, it is necessary to immediately begin a continuous transfer of one division at a time on the four available railroads from the area of Army Group Center to the northern flank of Army Group South until the situation there will not be restored. It goes without saying that in this case will be inevitable withdrawal of Army Group Center on the Dnieper line. We are talking about the fate of the Eastern Front, and there is no other way but the immediate transfer of large forces in the area of Kiev. Although Hitler calmly treated the concluded in my report quite transparent criticism, this conversation did not give him much pleasure. As a result of it was immediately issued an order oak, according to which Army Group Center, starting on September 17th, was to four roads to transfer as fast as possible at the same time four divisions to Army Group South. In addition, we were promised from the Western Front infantry units and replenishment to complete our divisions, a total of 32 battalions. After returning to our headquarters on September 15th in the evening, I gave the army group an order to withdraw all armies to the line militopole Dnieper Desna. The reader may have gotten the impression that in those days when the army group was fighting in front of the Dnieper line, the activities of its command mainly consisted of fighting with the OK and Hitler. In fact, all over and over again attempts to ensure that the general command took the necessary measures in a timely manner, and the inevitable is not always done too late, took up a significant part of our activities and cost a lot of nerves, especially since in the headquarters of the army group had already gotten into the habit of making quick decisions, and the character of the commander was little impressed by the repeated repetition of self-evident things and endless requests. In the end, it was this struggle and timely recognition of the necessity arising from the operational situation was the main distinguishing feature of the 1943 to 1944 campaign on the part of the German army. In general, the attempt to lift the veil over the enemy's plans, to understand how he is going to act, and in accordance with this to decide on the distribution and use of their forces, it is always only one, albeit a significant part of what in military affairs is considered a task of command. The other part is to devise a definite operation and to carry it out. If this part of the task of command has received but little reflection in the preceding statement, it is because we have no longer had the opportunity to carry out real operations. To describe in detail how the army group command, during this campaign alone, tried to parry the blows of the superior forces of the enemy when he could no longer belong to the palm of victory, would require the writing of another such book. I must confine myself to pointing out that we endeavoured, so far as it was possible with the forces at our disposal, not to give the initiative entirely to the enemy. Where we had any sufficient forces, we gave the enemy a frontal attack and inflicted heavy losses on him. In other cases, we tried by timely withdrawal in some areas to prevent him from advancing with superior forces to dislodge us from our positions. Many times we were able, by concentrating tank formations, to stop the enemy who had broken through, and when it was possible to use his mistakes, for example, when he dared to go too far forward after the breakthrough to make counterattacks. These battles were led by the command of the armies. A description of them would be beyond the scope of this book. It should be noted, however, that the relationship between the command of the group of armies and the subordinate armies were characterized by mutual trust. Army commanders, with the help of their skillful chiefs of staff in a difficult situation, always found a way out. They did not lose their heads when the situation took on a crisis character. They always showed understanding when the command of the group of armies in the interests of the overall situation was forced to intervene in their actions, or to take from one of the armies of the forces to transfer them to the other army, 
despite the tense situation. These were all men who knew their business well. Colonel General Hollett, commander of the Sixth Army, had been a division commander under me in the Crimea, and we had known him well ever since. He was a serious man with a solid character, with great willpower. He may have been without great pretensions, but he was characterised by a clear, sober mind and objective judgement he could be relied upon. As an infantryman, he was particularly keenly worried about the outcome of combat operations of troops, which in the current situation could not but be reflected in his mood. His chief of staff, General Bork, despite the fact that he is undoubtedly all given to the cause, was by no means a successful addition to his commander, at least this impression was formed by the command of the army group. As you know, it is not enough to join together two capable commanders, appointing one of them commander, the other the chief of staff. It is important that these commanders complement each other in their abilities, and that it is the chief of staff, who usually has the main responsibility for establishing contact with higher and subordinate authorities, had the necessary data for this purpose. The commander of the first tank army, Colonel General von Mackensen, inherited from his father, Field Marshal of the First World War and Adjutant General of the Kaiser, correctness, nobility and courtesy in dealing with people. He was a cavalryman, having previously served like his father in the Life Hussar Regiment, but there was nothing Hussar about him, he was judicious and pedantically precise in his work. In peacetime he coped well with the duties of the Chief of the Railroad Department of the General Staff. He became acquainted with the activities of the Army Commander while serving as Chief of Staff of the Army in Poland and on the Western Front. Later, when we were imprisoned together in the Vell Prison, he was a good friend to me, always ready to help. His Chief of Staff, General Wenk, was a very successful complement to his commander. As I have already mentioned when describing the winter campaign of 1942-43, Wenk at the beginning of it was the Chief of Staff and the soul of the 3rd Romanian Army on the Don. He then became Chief of Staff to Mackenzen. No matter how critical the situation on the front of the 1st Panzer Army, we were confident that Wenk, supported by his commander, who trusted him immensely, would always find a way out. Although he sometimes had to paint the situation to my Chief of Staff Bus in a very black light, he invariably ended his words with the phrase, well, OK, somehow we'll cope with it. He owed his optimism, cheerfulness and tirelessness, as well as the charm he had with people, to the fact that we nicknamed him God's Bird. It was an irony of fate that a man like Wenk did not pass the examination for the rank of lieutenant in the military district, which should have opened the way for him to serve in the general staff, only thanks to a good recommendation he was able to pass the second time successfully. Of the commander of the 8th Army, General Wheeler, I have previously spoken. The fortitude of this honest and straightforward man, a true resident of Lower Saxony, withstood all the trials in the future. The friendship that bound us since the times of our joint service in the Crimea, where he was my chief of staff, contributed greatly to our work together. Despite the fact that he was a very young army commander, he was able to quickly gain authority everywhere due to the power of his personality. He did not hesitate to speak frankly and with the highest officer of the SS troops, a protege of Himmler. An excellent assistant to Wheeler was his chief of staff, General Spidel, who had already distinguished himself under Wheeler's predecessor, General Kemp Heath, especially when he commanded the army group. Spidel, always calm and businesslike, possessed along with an excellent knowledge of staff work and extensive knowledge of general matters. The commander of the 4th Panzer Army, Colonel General Goth, was my predecessor as division commander in Lignitz, therefore much older than me. He had commanded a tank group when I was only a corps commander, and had extensive experience in the operational use of tank formations. It is all the more important to note that he maintained in our group of armies full loyalty to his junior commander. Small in stature, thin, he was always awake, very agile, friendly and willingly cheerful in the circle of younger comrades. He treated his subordinates very lovingly. He stated his point of view always very clearly and definitely. He showed great flexibility in the management of troops, especially in a difficult situation. With his soldierly directness, he impressed later even the American judges at Nuremberg. An impulsive man. Goth was perfectly complimented by his chief of staff, General Fangor, indefatigable and always cheerful hard worker, 
able to always quickly and well fulfil the plans of his commander, and in a difficult situation to give their own suggestions in order to find a way out of the situation. If, therefore, the command of the army group could fully trust the command of the subordinate associations, then it, for its part, could be quite superior command. Army commanders always knew what tasks they were to perform. Although the army group command often failed to receive from Hitler clear operational instructions, it still always clearly told the subordinate armies, what is our operational plan? We strove to set clear tasks before the armies, without interfering in the actions of commanders, except when we were forced to do so by the entire course of operations. It never happened, however, that the decision to be taken by the group commanders arrived untimely. If we made a promise, the armies knew that we would keep it, as well as the fact that the orders given by the headquarters of the army group, even if they provided for the transfer of compounds to other armies, must be steadily implemented. If between the army group command and the army's established relations of genuine trust, the main merit in this belongs to my closest assistants, primarily my chief of staff, General Bussey, and our excellent chief of operations, Lieutenant Colonel Schultz Butcher. It is well known that communication between the staffs of formations and associations on operational and tactical matters passes largely through the chief of staff and the chief of operations. When I was the commander of the army, I at least I had no desire to hang on the phone myself all the time. Above all, I avoided giving subordinate army commanders advice over the telephone, as unfortunately some commanders often do. Bussy and Schultz Butcher were particularly well suited to each other. Schultz Butcher, a man of great disposition, was as intelligent as he was modest, and although he sometimes liked to joke wickedly, he always remained polite. This very able officer, who possessed fine traits of character, unfortunately became one of the victims of July 20th. Bussy, whose importance to me personally I have already mentioned before, was always able to emphasise in what he was talking about, the very essence of the matter. When it was necessary, he showed himself as a very energetic person. When one of the chiefs of staff of the armies, of course, not without reason once again painted the situation in which his army was, in a black light, and doubted the possibility of accomplishing the task assigned to him, Bussy usually said, well, so bad things can not be so bad. It was not, however, a phrase thrown out of thin air, it was uttered by an experienced man who had lived through many crises, it was always followed by suggestions as to how to find a way out, or promises of assistance. With regard to some of the orders we received from above, however, B.C. Wussy would only throw up his hands and say it is difficult for a mere mortal to understand. In general, in our narrow circle, no one was shy to express his thoughts. The orders, about the detachment from reality which we so sharply talked about, were not, by the way, the brain children of the operational management of the old coal, ball, lightning. They came from Hitler. General Zeitzler was nicknamed Ball Lightning because his appearance as chief of the general staff in the OK, the impression of a lightning strike, and also because he demanded from his subordinates lightning fast fulfillment of their tasks. The spherical outline of his figure gave rise to another part of his nickname. Small in stature, he had a certain tendency toward fullness, which was emphasized by his round head, rosy cheeks, and budding baldness. His movements also resembled something of a balloon. Zeitzler was no friend of mine. When he was still a young officer, he served in the Office of National Defense under the OKB, and this institution was not particularly friendly to the OK, in which I then held the post of one Ober Quartermaster General of the General Staff. I was apparently not mistaken at the time in believing that Zeitzler at that time belonged to the group of officers who believed that the OKB should have an influence on the leadership of the land forces. If this was true, Zeitzler now had to pay for it severely. As chief of the army general staff, he now had to report to his former bosses Keitel and Jodel. He was removed from the management of land forces operations in many theatres of war, and had to feel where the creation of two instances for the leadership of the armed forces instead of one. During the war, Zeitzler was chief of staff of a tank corps, then of the first tank army, and distinguished himself here under the commander the future Field Marshal von Kleist, by his energy, efficiency and tactical skill. Hitler took notice of him and in the spring of 1942 transferred him to the post of Chief of Staff of the Army Group on the Western Front. 
he rightly believed that the energy Zeitzler extremely favourable effect on strengthening the defence of the French coast. After the resignation of Colonel General Golder, Hitler appointed Zeitzler as his successor. Although Zeitzler, not only energetic, but also unceremonious man, in many ways was a soldier of Hitler's type, the latter was still mistaken, believing that he would find in him a gutless tool. In any case, Zeitzler, from the moment when our headquarters took command over Army Group Don, always vigorously and persistently defended before Hitler our opinions and wishes, not considering that such resistance was very unpleasant to Hitler. Hitler once said to me, Zeitzler fights for your proposals like a lion only a man as insensitive to offence as Zeitzler could generally endure daily or rather nightly bickering with Hitler and reconcile with ever new disappointments. Chief of the general staff in the spirit of Malti or Schlieffen Zeitzler, in any case, was not, and in the position he occupied under Hitler, and could not be. In any case, cooperation between the army group headquarters and the chief of general staff developed in an atmosphere of trust. This was due in no small measure to the personality of the chief of operations, General Husinger. I had been on particularly friendly terms with him ever since he had worked under me in the operations directorate before the war. He was as much a gifted officer of the general staff as he was an amiable man of whole character.